America's Heartland is made possible by the United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KBIE to support America's heartland programming. Contributors include the following. I'm Rob Stewart. We're taking you to Maryland this time to discover how innovative oyster farmers are bringing in bounty from the bay, Chesapeake Bay. It's an aquaculture operation that is working to improve an important waterway. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Having a successful ag operation these days means having a focus on consumer demand. For one dairyman in Ohio, that means running a very different kind of operation. Hi, I'm Sharon Vaknin. Whether it's for a barbecue, Sunday dinner, or a special holiday occasion, Americans love their beef. We'll show you how to make your next beef dinner even better. I'm Kristen Samos. Pack up your paints. We're taking you to Northern California, where artists have the opportunity to work with farmers in capturing the beauty of rural America. Call it arts and agriculture. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's Heartland, living close to the land. There's a lot and a pride in the brand in America's heartland living close close to the land We show you how farmers and ranchers do their part to help protect the environment and that includes both agriculture and aquaculture Case in point, a Maryland oyster farm where the tasty shellfish is both a cash crop and a way to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. Oh, I love it. I couldn't see myself in an office. Kevin McLaren is a relative newcomer to Chesapeake Bay. He moved here in 1999. But this former Massachusetts resident says he's fallen in love with this huge historic estuary and the famous oysters grown and harvested here. We're about 100 miles from the ocean here. We're in a brackish environment where, from a biological standpoint, that's where oysters want to live. You get this broth of, of minerals and flavors that you know produce an oyster with, you know, I think, an exceptional flavor. Welcome to the farm, an oyster farm. Here, where the freshwater Chop Tank River flows into the Salty Bay, is where you'll find Chop Tank Oyster Company. Kevin and his partners hand raise close to two million oysters each year. I always say we're a little bit more like ranching than we are like farming. We're not really growing these oysters. We're just kind of taking care of them until they're ready for market. That care begins here at the hatchery, where the oysters grow from microscopic larvae into these tiny creatures called spat. Well, there's probably a thousand oysters in that hatchery. That's right, what looks like a handful of wet sand is actually thousands of oysters attached to bits of broken shell. After about three weeks, they're transferred onto these boxes made from window screens. They'll grow to about the size of a quarter and then be moved to these floats right on the bay, as many as 10,000 in each one. We grow them for a half a summer, and then we pull them out, we split them, tumble them, and put them back into bags at a lower level. And that process continues over two years until they're large enough to harvest. The harvested oysters are then taken to a facility close by where they're washed and packed into boxes destined for stores and restaurants all over Maryland. What's going on, Kevin? What's going on, Travis? Nothing. Some customers, like Travis Todd, can't wait yeah, for delivery. They take them right yeah, off thanks. the dock. Travis is the third generation of the Todd family at the Ocean Odyssey restaurant. What I really, really like about it is the fact that this is our local and native oyster, yet it's being grown 
Um, it's being grown rather than just harvested in the wild. What we have is some uh, rendered bacon and keep the fat. Uh, you're going to add to that fat, you're going to add onion and garlic. Today, Travis is making Oysters Baba Feller, a variation on the famous Oysters Rockefeller. Cracked pepper, lemon juice, heavy cream, arugula, and Parmesan cheese. As soon as you bread these things, you want to get them in the fryer. For something different, how about a po' boy? Shucked and breaded and fried, made from oysters less than an hour from the water. Ocean Odyssey is one of the local restaurants we have, and he uses our oysters in everything because he sees the quality of it, and for him, it's worth it. Chesapeake Bay is one of the world's largest estuaries. It's 200 miles long and as much as 30 miles wide, fed by 150 rivers and streams. That mix of fresh and salt water proved perfect for oysters and oystermen, who've been reaping Chesapeake's waterborne bounty for centuries. But in the last 50 years, population growth brought water pollution and disease. Today, the wild oyster population is less than 1% of what it was in the late 1800s. 20 years ago, some 6,000 oystermen worked these waters. Today, there are fewer than 500. Oysters are considered a keystone species, which means you know, it, it really does, it is the linchpin for the health of the bay. Kevin says oysters are more than just a product. They're an essential part of a healthy ecosystem. The guys who do this testing will tell you that an adult oyster will, will filter 50 gallons a day out of, the, out, out of the bay, you know, filtering it, taking the algae out. Thanks to efforts by dozens of environmental groups, scientists, and government agencies, Chesapeake Bay is slowly getting cleaner. But if we could get the oysters back to historic levels, you know, you would see this, the, the, the green color drop out of this water in no time at all. Every oyster that's coming off my farm is one more wild oyster that's left in place. This may take a long time, but it may work. The fact that we can grow great products like this, uh, make them marketable, sell them, and improve the water systems as we go along, um, that to me is just a win for everybody. Oysters, clams, and mussels make up a significant share of America's aquaculture production. But shellfish aren't the only choice on the seafood platter. Catfish, shrimp, and salmon are also popular products for fish farmers across the country. Dairy farmers will milk more than 8 million cows in the U.S. this year. Most dairy farms are still family-run operations, like this one in Albany, Ohio. But what sets this one apart is the relationship between the farmer and a self-proclaimed dairy evangelist. I think that the experience of enjoying dairy products is hardwired in human beings. I still feel good when I'm drinking a glass of good fresh milk. Warren Taylor is passionate about milk. The Central Ohio producer believes that consumers should be able to enjoy milk that he says is richer, creamier, and tastes much closer to what nature intended. It tastes like you've added vanilla to this. Yes. It, it, and that you've sweetened it. Absolutely. And, and that's there's cold nothing concentrated, added. nothing added. Wanting to reach consumers looking for something different in dairy, Warren established Ohio Snowville Creamery. His processing technique creates milk that tastes slightly different from what others may be pouring from the bottle. Warren says it's a taste that goes back generations. The flavor of fresh milk is unique. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of people haven't tasted it anymore. They don't, they don't even know what it is. His recipe doesn't start by using a different type of cow. Instead, Warren puts them on a different type of diet. It begins with the cows that are on grass. They live their whole life outdoors. The only time they're under roof is when they're being milked. Uh, they produce less milk, but the milk is very rich and delicious. To assist him in developing his dairy products, Warren turned to friend and farmer Bill Dix. Dix has been raising grass-fed dairy cows for 20 years, adjusting the grass-fed options daily by rotating the animals over several pastures. In every milking, they go on a new, uh, new piece of pasture that hopefully, ideally, is just perfect grazing. And you want to farm staggered in growth so that every day when those cows leave the milking parlor, there's a 
a pasture that it has the perfect feed for a lactating cow. Warren pays a premium for the milk he receives from area farmers to offset the fact that grass-fed cows produce less milk than those raised on grain. He says supporting those farmers is important for his product and his rural community. We share that value with the farmers. So we've made a difference in our dairy farmers business lives in those families and in addition we have 30 full-time employees here in the second poorest second most underemployed county in the state of ohio warren's milk is pasteurized to meet food safety guidelines but at a lower legally allowed temperature as for homogenization other people confuse pasteurization homogenization homogenization is the process by which the fat is broken down to be so small that it remains evenly distributed in the milk even though it weighs a lot less. So with our milk, the cream rises to the top. Another aspect of Warren's dairy operation is shipping the creamery's milk only a limited distance, cutting down the time from cow to customer. We go to great effort to get our milk in the grocery stores just as quickly as we can. If our milk hasn't sold within 10 days of it being produced and bottled, it's taken off the shelf. Snowville Creamery bottles about 9,000 gallons of milk a week. Snowville Creamery is one of a growing number of farms across the heartland that target a specific segment of the retail market, giving consumers some additional food choices and providing options for farmers as well. The major satisfaction is, is we're putting out superior food and people uh, seem to be appreciating it. And that, that's where the real satisfaction comes. So it's the, it's the reaction of people to the experience, to the taste, that I think gives me the greatest pleasure. It still raises the hair on my arm. The next time you enjoy an ice cream cone, think about this. It takes 12 pounds of milk to make one gallon of ice cream. And if you're buttering that bagel, it takes 21 pounds of milk to make one pound of butter. I'm Kristen Samo. Still ahead, we'll take you to Northern California for a program that pairs farmers and artists in capturing the iconic images of agriculture in America. Do you like a nice tall glass of orange juice in the morning with your breakfast? Well, you're not alone. Folks continue to drink more and more of the orange stuff. And when you get to the orange juice aisle at your grocery store, you're going to find a lot more choices than ever before. No pulp fiction here. No matter how much pulp your palate desires, you'll find it. No pulp, some pulp, extra pulp. Most juice comes from orange juice concentrate, which means the juice from the oranges is heated, water is evaporated out, and the sugars and solids are frozen. It then gets mixed with a little fresh juice and water and shipped. Not from concentrate juice is flash pasteurized after it's squeezed. Don't forget frozen cans of juice in your grocer's freezer section. Nutritionally, the juices have similar vitamins and minerals. Of course, orange juice is packed with vitamin C, You'll also find juices fortified with calcium and vitamin D, and orange juice with reduced sugar and calories. Ever wonder how many oranges it takes to make a typical carton of orange juice? 10, 20, 30? Actually, the magic number, 18. Think about that the next time you take one of these off the shelf. Beef is one of the most popular meats in America, and it can be used for a lot more than just hamburgers. Today I'm joined by Karina of Winterport Farms. So tell me a little bit about your farm. Uh, well, it's a family farm. Um, I'm the fifth generation to live on the farm, and we have uh, 180 acres. We have 50 cows on the farm. Grass-fed, what exactly does that mean? It means grass from the day they're off their mother's milk you have to be sure that there's enough pasture for every animal. Today, we are lucky enough to be cooking with your beef. So tell me what you'll be making. Um, I'm gonna make cross-cut beef shanks, 
which are one of my favorite cuts. They're really economic and affordable. They're simple to cook and they're really versatile. And so is ground beef. So today I'm making an Asian style meatball with a sweet pineapple sauce. Yeah. But first, let's do yours. Great. You can do this dish in a pot or in a crock pot. Um, so a pan on the stove, that's how I'm gonna set it up today. Put the shanks into the pan. And then if you wanna put some onions and garlic on top. And then I'm just gonna pour water in the pot, get it about halfway covered. So you put that on low for about five hours or in the crock pot on high for about five hours. I have one here that I actually cooked in a crock pot. And then what you're gonna do is shred them with two forks. Okay. So then what we're gonna do is actually fry that up carnita style. So we're gonna go ahead and put this beef in the oil here. It sizzle around, it gets kind of crispy, kind of okay. caramelized a little bit. Right. You wanna sprinkle in a little cumin, a little yep. oregano, give it a little taco flavor. And we've got cilantro, homemade salsa, and a little bit of sour cream. So for my dish, we're making Asian-style meatballs with pineapple sauce. Now, I love ground beef, mostly because it's just so versatile. You can use it in so many different ways. Um, so for this dish, it's actually quite simple. We're using a few popular Asian ingredients, two tablespoons of soy sauce in there, a little bit of sesame oil. Why don't you peel just a little bit of that ginger and I will mince up a little bit of parsley and ketchup. Now, what I like to do sometimes is instead of using ketchup, I'll do a little bit of sriracha, which is an Asian hot sauce, but you can use any hot sauce in this. Mince up some green onion, and maybe you can uh, just crack an egg into that bowl. Okay, and the egg acts to bind it all together, yep. right? The egg will bind it all together. These are Asian style breadcrumbs, and they're a lot airier than your regular home style breadcrumbs. So I'm putting about a quarter to a half a cup in here, and mix that up for me. What goes into the ground beef? Um, actually, it's it's trimmings from all different cuts of the beef. So generally not so much the filet, but just about everything else. And you know, the secret to very light and airy meatballs mm -hmm. is not to overmix it. Oh, okay. And we're using a mini muffin tin. Why don't we form these into small two inch meatballs? Perfect. All right. So now this can go in the oven. All right, while those are baking, let's make our sauce. This is really easy. We're using uh, pineapple chunks in the recipe. So we're going to use the juice from this can. We'll just strain it out. That's going to reduce down into a nice syrup. So I'm going to add crushed garlic. And of course, because these are Asian style meatballs, some soy sauce. We're gonna do about a quarter cup here. We'll let that thicken up, and while we're doing that, let's put the pineapples on top of the meatball. Yum. One small chunk on top of each meatball. And then we're just going to put it back in the oven for a couple of minutes to let that pineapple heat up a bit. And the juice from the pineapple will go down into the meatball. We are going to skewer these with the pineapple. And we're just going to take that and spoon it over a little bit on each meatball. And now we can eat. So it was that easy. All right, let's dig in. Okay. I am dying to try one of these tacos. You can really taste the difference between grass-fed and grain-fed beef. So nutritional, mm -hmm. lean, and it's got that delicious meaty flavor. Yeah. I can't get enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. That is so good. Lots of folks love beef on their dinner table. Americans consumed more than 26 billion pounds of beef in 2010. And lots of American beef makes its way north, south, and west. Canada, Mexico, South Korea, and Japan are big importers of American beef. Artists have been painting rural landscapes for centuries, working outdoors to capture the subtle changes in light and color on fields and farm buildings. 
And here in Northern California, one unique partnership has brought together farmers and artists in encouraging that creative spirit. The scenic beauty of America's farm and ranch land has long been a natural inspiration for artists and photographers. From sweeping fields of South Dakota wheat to the wide open spaces of Colorado cattle country to the rolling hills of California's Cape Valley. This is um, the second time I've been here at this farm. I'm trying to capture these hills, and I've been working on it like in between when I'm not even here to see how I can get the feel of the, just the curves and the undulations of the land, and uh, that's my goal today. I am painting the hedgerow over there and the orchard in front of it. I like that contrast of that big dark windbreak and I like the lime green line of the, I think they're apricots, over there. Not wanting to impose or trespass, many artists often limit themselves to accessing heartland views from public roadways. But California farmer and fellow artist Annie Main recognized those limitations and began inviting creative folks onto her farmland in Yolo County, east of San Francisco. Having our own farm and seeing the landscape and seeing the beauty, that was when I started inviting other artists here to places that they would never have the opportunity to go to. I think somebody's gonna go paint out there. Annie reached out to an existing Yolo County Arts program, together creating the Arts and Ag Project. It's an outreach effort that connects artists with farmers, growers, and ranchers, promoting art and agriculture. Any way that you can get people to stop and think about where their food comes from and the importance of uh, fresh food, fresh local food, uh, and if we could do that through a painting, that's fabulous. The program allows as many as 35 artists to visit a Yolo County farm or ranch each month, usually in the early morning or late afternoon, taking advantage of the natural light. I'll look at the hills, the lighting on the hills, and it is a moment, you know, where that light hits it and creates the scene, and it is so incredibly beautiful. And then there's a challenge of seeing if you can figure out how to catch it, you know, on a piece of paper in watercolor or even in a photograph. The thing that I like about it is it puts me in touch with nature. Mary Ann Kirsch has been teaching art for 25 years and believes that programs like these help people to understand the importance of maintaining open space and protecting rural land. This is a valuable part of our life and a valuable part of our environment. And that's key to what's happening right now because I think preserving the environment is like a number one issue for us. And this project actually has given me access to um, lots of um, venues. Rebecca Ryland uses watercolors in crafting her landscape artwork. She enjoys the solitude of working in an environment that's filled with plants instead of people. I think the arts benefit all of us. For the farmer, um, it's been really, I think, some, I think sometimes they enjoy having visitors on the farm. Some of them definitely do. And of course, if they don't, they're, they make themselves scarce. So it is, it's, um, it's an activity where everybody gets to be together. Well, this is my very first attempt too. The Arts and Ag Project in Yolo County has proven to be so successful that it recently received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts providing a model for other communities that want to showcase their tie to the land and American agriculture. It's exceeded our wildest expectations and now we're getting phone calls from all over the country, from Alaska to Texas, uh, people who can see how maybe this could work in their own community. The completed artworks capture iconic images of rural life in America and many of the projects find their way to a year-end public event the proceeds from which are used to promote farmland preservation. The message is that this is worth saving, that we really want these farms to exist in the future. I really feel that if we lose the appreciation for our farmlands, we lose a part of our American soul. I think it connects the community to their place. And ultimately, that's, that's the power of, of 
where we are and who we are and what we want for our community. That's gonna wrap it up for us. We're glad you could come along to discover the interesting people and places in America's heartland. And don't forget, you can stay in touch with us 24 seven. We make it easy on you. You can find us on some of your favorite sites and you can see all of our video and stories online at americasheartland.org. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland, living close to the land There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand In America's heartland, living close, close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by the United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, Financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's heartland programming. Contributors include the following.